All right, uh, welcome back. Uh, in this video, I'll be talking about uh, explicit central differencing. So we're going to start from our generic differential equation dy dx equal f. We discretize this using Taylor series. Um, so we approximate the slope by the difference in the y value divided by the difference in the x value. Uh, the distance between these two points in the or along the x-axis is 2 delta x. So uh, in the numerator we have y plus 1 minus y i minus 1 which is centered at point xi and that's why on the right side we have everything in terms of xi and yi. And then divide by 2 del x because the difference between these two along the x-axis is 2 del x. So from here we assume that the higher index is unknown and the lower index is known. So, so we solve for y plus 1. It's very simple. We move everything to the right side. We assume that everything with lower indices are known, so we solve for y plus 1. I think that is how we can use um, the central difference to solve differential equation. So let's look at one example, same example we talked about on page 123 of notes, uh, which is the differential equation with three y values, if you remember y1, y2, y3. Okay. So now, uh, right, so we loop over all intervals, given that yi plus 1 is related to yi minus 1. So if I want to calculate y1, I have to know y minus 1 and y0 because we don't have any indices before or below, below 1. We cannot start from i equal... Um, we cannot start from i equal 1, right? Because if you put i equal 1, then you need to know y0. And we don't have y0. We start from index 1. So now I'm going to plug i equal 2. So that means y3 is related to y1. Okay? And on the right side, it's going to be x2 and y2. <clears throat> so we're going to start from i equal 2. So let's go back to code. Well, here I start from 3, but that's the same as 2, because on the, on the left side I have i. So if you have i plus 1 here, then you can start from 2. But if you have i here, then you can start from 3. Now if you have i here, on the other side should be i minus 2. If you have i plus 1 here, then should be i minus 1 here. So I hope this is not confusing. Alright, because I have i on the left side, then I start from 3. So here's i minus 2. And then whatever is inside f should be i minus 1. One index higher than yi. You can go back to the notes. So this is one higher than that. Okay. So, and of course you multiply by del 2 del x. Okay. So then you can solve for yi from yi minus 2. Then you have yi. You already have yi minus 1. So... I can go and plug in i equal 4 and calculate y4 based on y3 and y2 and so forth. Okay, so one thing to note that is here you need to know two boundary conditions. You need to know uh, y1 and y2 to be able to predict y3. Okay. So that's different from forward Euler where we had only one boundary conditions. Now this time we have to have two because the way we formulated uh, i plus one requires i and i minus one information. Okay. So this is basically the part of the script. It's just nothing but two lines. <clears throat> In fact, one line, the last line here is to update the x value. Okay, so um, I think that is it. So let me go ahead and run the code. Well, actually, we can go all the way down. So let me just run the code and compare the results. So now the pink one 
essential difference, black one is RK4, RK2, and the dot is forward difference or forward Euler. So if you look at the result, the last three are very close. That means central difference, RK4, RK2, they're, they're almost close, they're very close. Uh, forward difference is off. And the reason is because forward difference is first order, RK2 is second order, central difference is also second order, and RK4 is fourth order. So these are more accurate methods. Okay, and that's why they're closer together uh, as opposed to forward difference, which is first order. Okay. All right, so sometimes you ask a question, well, I know all these methods, but when I have to use which? Okay, so the first method, which is forward Euler, is the simplest. Maybe that's the first thing you want to try, but you know that that's less accurate. If you want to be more accurate, then maybe RK4 is the best. If you have problems implementing RK4 because it's a bit difficult, you have to calculate 4K values, <clears throat> then uh, central differencing or RK2 would be the option. All right, so let's go back to the notes. Um, okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is we're going to move on to now implicit methods. So we're talking about this accuracy. There's another issue is which is stability. Okay. The method can be accurate, but could be unstable for some delta x values. Like, if you change your delta x, you see, you know, some weird oscillations or weird, you know, result, and suddenly the function, you know, goes up and down drastically by just changing delta x a little bit. And if delta x is small enough, the method is accurate. So. Uh, these are two things that we're going to cover, I think, maybe in the next video or so. Uh, one is the accuracy, and then the other one is the stability. Okay, so accuracy has to do with, you know, if um, for a fixed delta x, how much or how accurate the result is going to be. Okay, uh, stability has to do with. Um, uh, so with the with the same delta x, okay, uh, in the long run, with the same delta x that the method was accurate maybe in the small x values, if you go to some large x values with the same delta x, the method can be inaccurate. So the method is accurate somewhere and inaccurate somewhere else with a given delta x. That has to do with the stability. But if the method is inaccurate everywhere for specific or for fixed delta x, that has to do with the accuracy. Okay, so we're going to dig into this more in details uh, in the next video or so. But for now, we're going to focus on implicit methods. So implicit methods are stable. Okay. Um, we're not talking about accuracy for now. Implicit methods are more stable than explicit methods. That means if they are accurate, they're going to be accurate throughout, regardless of the x. Explicit methods are not like this. They can be accurate in some region of x with the same delta x and could be completely inaccurate somewhere else. Okay, that means they're unstable. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. But implicit methods, either they're good or they're bad. It's not like somewhere in the domain they're good and somewhere in the domain of X they're bad. Okay. All right. So um, the first implicit method we're going to look at is implicit Euler. In implicit Euler, we treat the derivative as uh, the approximation for the secant line which is the difference in y divided by difference in x, pretty much like forward Euler, so there's no difference so far. The only difference is on the right side, where in forward Euler or explicit Euler, we had yi and xi here. Now in implicit methods, we're going to have i plus 1 on the right side. So now you see that yi plus 1 shows up on both sides of the equation, and that's why it's explicit. If yi plus 1 is the unknown, you see the unknown shows up on both sides, and now it's it's difficult to solve for yi plus 1. 
you have to solve an algebraic equation to solve or basically to obtain y i plus one. Okay, and that is why it's called uh, why it's called implicit methods. Okay, so let's see how we can solve this implicit equation. Well, let's plug in i from one to whatever i can go to. So start from i equal one. We're going to have y two minus y one divided by del x is equal to f. And on the right side, we have x2 and y2, right there, like this. Then we're going to plug in i equal 2, 3, 4, all the way to n minus 1. So for each i, we get a different equation. We can reorder each equation to get something like this for the first one. It's going to be y2 from here plus... Um, I think it should be minus. There's a typo here. So it's y2 minus del x times f. Well, I have minus everywhere else except this guy, so this should be minus. Okay, minus f times del x equals now y1 goes to the right side. Why? Because y1 is a boundary condition, so we know the y value at the first x value. That's why I moved it to the right side because we know it. And the unknowns are, well, in this equation, the unknown is y2. Okay, now we do the same thing for the second equation. We keep y3 and x3 and everything with 3 index on the left side and move everything to the right side. Well, because y2 is also unknown, right? We haven't solved it yet, so I keep it on the left side too. So then on the right side is nothing but 0. Okay, you do the same thing with the third equation. You get y4, x4, y4. And y3 is also on the left side because it's unknown. We haven't solved it yet. And right side again is 0. Okay, so these are nothing but reordering of these equations. So now you see I have n equations here with n unknowns. Well, y2 is unknown, y3 is unknown, all the way to n, y n. So how many, uh, how many equations do I have? I have n minus 1 equations also n minus 1 unknowns. And because the number of unknowns and equations are the same, I should be able to solve them using uh, any linear solver. Okay. Well, depending on if actually this, this can be nonlinear equation, because if f is nonlinear in y2, then this whole thing is going to be nonlinear on nonlinear in y2, this is going to be nonlinear in y3, and so forth. So what we're going to do now well, is we're going to have a root finder to solve for the root of these coupled n minus 1 equations. So now you have to go back to chapter 1, the first video maybe or so, where we talk about the root finder in multi-dimension. Okay, so Let's look at one example using uh, implicit method. So we're going to look at this problem and try to solve it using an implicit method. So let's start from x1 equals 0. x2 is going to be x1 plus del x. x3 is equal to x2 plus del x and so forth. Right? So we're going to plug in i equal 2. Then this is going to be y2 minus y1 divided by del x, on the left side we're going to have x2 squared times y2. Okay, so this is when i equals 2. We reorder the terms and have y2 on the left side. So y2 and x2 raised to the second power plus times y2 times del x on the left side, and then y1 because we know it in the boundary condition on the right side. Okay. So we keep going like that until we construct the whole n minus 1 nonlinear equations for different, you know, by going from i equal 2 to n, we construct this nonlinear system. So in the next video, I'll be showing you how to solve this using some nonlinear root finder. Okay, thank you so much for watching and stay tuned for the next video.